Hello everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to a panel session on safeguarding critically endangered species in Southeast Asia. My name is Anthony Sebastian, call me Tony. And before I introduce our panelists, let me just ask you to imagine. Imagine a set of concentric circles, which means each circle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller towards the center. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of what conservation deals with in terms of critically endangered species. As a species descends into the almost dear threat of extinction, its world becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And likewise, the efforts that are focused on these species also become smaller and smaller and smaller. So they're coming down the range. Uh, let me explain this to you. On the widest range, we're looking at species, we're looking at protected areas, we're looking at government systems and all of that. We can address all the issues that bring a species towards endangerment. But as we come to the center, we become a very, very small world in small in resources, small in range, often small in little locations around the world, and the species then become just tiny little pockets. And this in, is, in general, the case with critically endangered species. So our panel today is going to explore this situation. We have with us three esteemed panelists who represent three organizations that are part of a coalition. And this coalition is called the Asian Species Action Partnership, ASAP. It is a co coalition very much in the same form as the AFA coalition. It brings together organizations that have a single focus uh, and have a combined focus towards a single cause. And in their case, it is about saving, or at least managing, these critically endangered species and prevent them from being wiped out completely from the world. So let us look at our three panelists. I'm going to ask them uh, to introduce themselves and where they come from. Uh, let me just tell you that the first comes from an organization that's focused on building capacity to deal with uh, endangered species in Southeast Asia. The second is a panelist who brings the perspective of a national in initiative, in this case, Vietnam. And the third is the director of the regional program of an international organization, which is called Traffic. And they deal in the trade of endangered, uh, of, of wildlife. So over to you guys. I'm going to begin with uh, Jessica, or Jess. Uh, Tell us about yourself. Thanks, uh, t um, Anthony, and thanks everyone for joining in, in this session. Um, so my name is Jess. I work for Mandai Nature. We're based in Singapore, but we're very much focused in the region of Southeast Asia. Um, we, we, we have species at the core of our work, and we're, we're a, con a non-profit conservation organization. So species is right at the core, but in the last few years, we've recognized the need of protecting habitats where the species, you know, the places where the species live in, um, but also people, because as our plenary this morning, um, Adam Miller mentioned, you can't save animals without working with people. So we've got uh, habitat ecosystems and, and communities as our second and third pillar of our organization. Now within Mandai Nature, I oversee a lot of our bird programs, which is roughly 15 projects across Southeast Asia, but I also oversee work around illegal wildlife trade in Southeast Asia and opportunities to address the trade um, you know, in, in the form of sustainable agriculture, different livelihoods like ecotourism. So the, the, those are just some of my Mandai Nature um, hats that I wear. Um, but separate to Mandai Nature, I also um, help coordinate the activities of the IUC and SSC. If you all don't know what SSC stands for, it's the Species Survival Commission under the, under the IUCN. And I help coordinate activities of the Asian Songbird Trade Specialist Group and the Hornbill Specialist Group, focusing on a specific animal, and that's the helmet hornbill. That's me. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. 
Okay, long? Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Long Thang Ha. Um, I work uh, in Vietnam. We base in Da Nang City. Uh, the organization right now is uh, Green Viet Biodiversity Conservation Center. It's a national NGO working on biodiversity conservation. Um, I start my uh, job uh, as a rescuer. I rescue primates in the uh, uh, Kuk National Park uh, since 1999. I've been there for five years, um, work with uh, endangered primates. Um, and then um, I found Green Viet in 2012, um, and I moved to central Vietnam to work with uh, also primate, but in the forest. Um, and then 2021, uh, me and our college and other um, supporter, we uh, found the uh, wildlife, Vietnam Wildlife Conservation Funds. Uh, which is support the Vietnamese local and national NGO. And 19, 2018, I'm invited to become a community member of ISAP, uh, which is Kanita and I working together and, and, and try to support um, critical endangered species in Asia, in Southeast Asia. That's about me. Thank you. Thank you, Long. Over to you, Kanita. Thanks, Sunny. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kanita. As Johnny said, I'm the Regional Director for Traffic in Southeast Asia. Uh, for those of you who don't know who or what Traffic is, we are an organization that is focused around addressing issues of wildlife trade, both legal and illegal. However, a big part of our program here in Southeast Asia is rather focused on addressing illegal trade, um, wildlife crime associated issues, um, and that means working closely with enforcement agencies, working with private sector bodies, um, going deeper into issues of demand reduction and consumption, and a whole gamut of issues that is about trade and the supply and the demand of, of uh, various wildlife species. A big part of that is also about reducing threats to trade uh, for species that are already threatened, and this is where ASAP comes in. Um, and within ASAP, I have been involved in ASAP since 2016, and I'm currently the Deputy Chair of ASAP. Thanks. Thank you. So let's jump straight into this discussion. Uh, we're going to try and cover different topics. I mean, obviously, the issue of safeguarding critically endangered species in this region is, is a very wide area. Uh, we've, we've picked three, uh, and if we have time, possibly four, uh, issues to discuss. Uh, some of you will know that I have already, uh, over the course of today, been soliciting some questions from the floor. Uh, we won't be having a question and answer uh, session, per se, but I will bring those questions that you have given to me, and I will put them to the panelists. All right, so let's begin. The first thing we're going to talk about is coalitions. Uh, and this is because I think all of us here in this room are part of a coalition. And there are pros and cons, and there are struggles, but there are also huge advantages to working through coalitions. We would like to explore what the lessons are uh, in terms of organization forming coalitions, uh, specifically as an approach to safeguard critically endangered species. Yeah? So, the question is, do they work? Are there strengths to a single organization or a partnership going it alone or going through a coalition? Let's begin uh, with uh, Kanita as the deputy chair of uh, ASAP, uh, and I'll give this question to you. Do you think that coalitions have had more success in safeguarding critically endangered species than organizations or countries that have gone it alone? It's a bit of a loaded question, but <clears throat> okay. Um, I mean, obviously, coalitions are the way to go. Uh, the, especially when you're talking about issues affecting you know, critically endangered species or threatened species, uh, the issues are too complex for any one person or any one organization to solve on their own. And this is where uh, ASAP is, is rather unique, and I'm going to do a little bit of, of a pitch about ASAP. I don't know how many of you here know who or what ASAP is. 
Um, and the sole purpose of, of ASAP being established is because we realised there are so few people who are actually doing something, doing enough to prevent species extinctions. And what that means is that more and more species are becoming critically endangered. And ASAP was established for that very purpose, to try and build that support, to establish this platform, to get as many organisations to come on board, to become part of ASAP to work on critically endangered species. We currently have um, 200 and about 240 organisations worldwide who are part of ASAP, and 60% of this are organisations within Southeast Asia. And we didn't realise that there was so much interest from within the region to work on critically endangered species in Southeast Asia. There are about 285 species that are considered critically endangered. This number is increasing every single day, which means we meet we need more organisations who are working from the ground, on the ground, working with partners. Um, and we have seen this interest grow in the last six years. Uh, thanks, Kanita. Can I bring in uh, Lung here? Because, in case you do not know, Lung is the sole guardian of one of the most stunning primates in Southeast Asia, and it's called the Duke. Uh, perhaps you'd like to come into this and say, and feed into this question about coalitions. Yeah, yeah I think um, coalition today is important um, at all level, but in perspective of the national and local NGO working in Vietnam, I found that it's, it, that perspective, it helped to engage more people to support the, the species and especially the critical endangered species. Um, take example of uh, Green Viet and 2015, we start to engage uh, working with private sector, uh, start with the primate conservation program. Um, and then we work with uh, FFI, Fauna and Flora, try to bring the people from private sector to the um, see the species and the habitats of the species, including the Duke language. Um, and it's amazing that the program that involve uh, bank people, um, IT company, um, and investment company, they all come and interest and getting interest with the conservation of the Duke. And they are interested because of the coalitions. Yeah, because we yeah. open the um, open the opportunity for people to really see what happened on yeah. the ground and helping the species in different way. Yeah, and perhaps this is where Jess, you come in because you are the you are supporting this coalition, right? Yep. So um, we we are Amanda Nature is hosting the IUCN SSC. Um, Asian Species Action Partnership, but um, I guess my, my little bit on coalitions is really, um, just for you all out there as well, Mandai Nature is the conservation arm of the Mandai Wildlife Group, and that group operates uh, the four wildlife parks in Singapore, the Singapore Zoo, Bird Paradise, Night Safari, and River, River Wonders. Um, so we have a huge um, XT2 conservation machine behind us, and for the longest time, you know, um, ex C2 people and in C2 people, people working in the field and outside the field, have always been working in silos. So for us, I think the, the biggest push as an organization is how do we join those two halves together? How do, how do you get ex C2 people to work effectively with in C2 people, thereby achieving more, I mean, better conservation for highly threatened species? So, and with, you know, with the ex C2 body behind us, we can really push for this because we also subscribe to what we call the One Plan Approach, which is the IUC and SSC's initiative to join, to exactly you know, fuse those two halves together um, to achieve conservation, especially for critically endangered species. Uh, Long, perhaps you, do you have both components of, uh, as uh, Jess is talking about, the in situ and the ex situ, or do you focus only on one side of that? Yeah, I focus on the um, um, in situ work, um, but I found that people also interest in ex situ work as well. Uh, people often come and ask how they can help the species is been traced, like including primate, it's been traced in the market. Um, mm. So 
the interest is there. But my organization is working mostly with the forest. Yes, yes. Yes, so um, just to add on to that, as an example of coalitions, uh, in 2015, uh, the songbird trade became apparent uh, as the big issue for songbirds across Southeast Asia. And um, the other species being the Harvard hornbill, being traded for its cask. Um, and what, what the, the threat of the species, right, which is the trade, led to us forming two coalitions, for like a better way of describing it, but really two specialist groups. So that Asian songbird trade specialist group that I mentioned earlier, as well as the hornbill specialist group, were in a way formed and rejuvenated because of a threat to a species that, that's brought them from, you know, whatever threat, in, uh, threat status to close to extinct in a while. Um, but yeah, and since then we've seen a lot of activity around addressing the trade of songbirds and hornbills across the region and beyond. Okay. Uh, Karita, did you want to jump in there? Well, <coughs> simply to say that, uh, you know, ASAP in many ways is a bit of a, I guess, a matchmaking organization because you've got so many organizations working on a whole range of different issues, whether they're a donor, uh, whether they are a, a CSO, whether they are an organization working with uh, in situ or ex situ, it is very much about making the connections with the right individuals, with the right organizations. And we have seen how this has been extremely beneficial for a number of critically endangered species in Southeast Asia. All right. This, this is uh, making me think about uh, the capacity. I mean, obviously, these coalitions. Uh, have their, uh, you're showing strengths and, and the ability to attract donors, for example. Uh, but how do you address capacity? Now, you know, I've thought about this for a while, and I think that the conservationists right across Asia uh, face a serious lack of capacity. And the capacity is, is to be effective in the in their causes, in their specific projects, or their actions. Uh, I, I'm sure all of us here uh, work with or for organizations that are struggling in this sense. And capacity often uh, can be translated into a simple term, money. You say, we just don't have enough money. Uh, but often it's not necessarily just money or lack of money. It's sometimes the lack of the ability to source for money. Uh, do you have actually an institution within your uh, department, within your own organization that's focused on fundraising, for example? And how much resources do you put into that? Uh, and how much resources does that take away from your core cause when you're spending all this time and, and effort to, to raise funds for your, just for your core operations of your organization? Uh, so technical knowledge uh, is... Uh, it's a result of, of financial uh, challenges. And the technical knowledge of it, uh, it's that, how do we get the technical knowledge that is relevant to the different settings within the region? Yeah? I'd like to start here with leading into, with, with Jess, uh, because of Monday Nature's uh, focus. You know, uh, would you like to share your experience in building the capacity to safeguard these critically endangered species in Southeast Asia? Sure. And um, so to put it in context, on Monday Nature, we do um, financially support programs across Southeast Asia. And we do work with partners uh, on the ground. We don't have a presence in Asia, but we do fund what we call local national NGOs to build their capacity so they can be more effective. And what we found in the region, as um, Anthony rightly pointed out, is many of them spend too much time trying to put grant proposals and all that, do the admin right work of their organizations so to, to even have time to spend on the operations that they do. And that, that's a huge challenge. Um, so how we've tried to address that really is to develop programs within, within Mandai Nature and the partners that we work with to address, to address those gaps. And it's as easy as soft skills, like how do I write a financial report uh, effectively, right? So I can actually talk about how I, how I spend my, my funding to a donor. Um, so, so, and we do it two ways. Um, one is to try to create a hub in, within Singapore to make courses like this accessible to people, because, and sometimes these courses don't really exist at all, so it's even to create courses from scratch. But more importantly, to make it relevant to the region. I think a lot of these courses are available in languages that many parts of Southeast Asia, they, they, don't, they don't speak. So how do we actually build capacity 
um, in, in, in local people so they can be more sustainable. And that is really bringing all these courses, making it available and accessible, maybe even financing it, um, so that people in the region can access it and get trained up and be more effective um, in conservation. So one is to do that, to finance and support. The other one uh, we do as well as, um, because we have the Monday Wildlife Group behind us, is we do bring, and we do what we call a staff exchanges. So we have people from the region, you know, especially in the areas of veterinary care and animal husbandry, come over to our parks and get attached to our vets, our animal care, care staff, and actually get trained up in all those skills. So how do we, and we do work not just with NGOs, but also with government agencies across Southeast Asia. Uh, so that's pointing towards a, an institutional approach towards that, you know, building a core like a center of excellence, which then supplies or, or supports uh, a, a wider audience across the region. Uh, Kanita, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I have, I guess, two perspectives to offer. And one is, I'll start off uh, with what Jess has just talked about in terms of, you know, the basics of um, how to do how to run an NGO, for example. One of, one of the key things uh, that ASAP does is uh, to build institutional capacity. Um, and we, we sent out a simple questionnaire to all the ASAP members and, and to ask them what sort of areas would they like to build capacity on. Um, and when we started this process, we thought there was going to be uh, you know, requests for, you know, this is a particular issue with this species, what can we do to save it? But a vast majority of them came back and said, actually, we, we don't know how to write funding proposals. Um, we don't know how to manage large grants, for example. We want to get large grants, but the donors don't want to give us large grants if we don't have a governance system in place. So one of the, the, the um, key programs uh, we started off with is this thing called is the Essentials of NGO Management. And we found that a lot of ASAP partners felt that it really benefited them. And this is something that we would like to do um, in the long term. And again, this is about building institutional capacity for organizations working on critically endangered species here in Southeast Asia. The other perspective I have to offer is, is traffic's work, uh, particularly in terms of addressing illegal wildlife trade. Over the decades, we've trained uh, thousands of, of law enforcement agencies and private sector bodies, for example. And sometimes it's as simple as, you know, this particular animal that is in front of them, is it domesticated? Is it wildlife? Is it protected? It is legal? Is it legal? Is it illegal? And more and more, private sector bodies come into the picture. Uh, wildlife trafficking in the post. Uh, when we first started talking about it, people thought it was crazy, and it is crazy. But there are so many instances where wildlife is packed in a parcel and sent by post. So we started engaging with Post Malaysia here in Malaysia. And it was as simple as education and awareness. And that simple step of, of sort of spreading awareness uh, resulted in a huge change institutionally within Post Malaysia, where we started working with them through a four-year project. And they started institutionalizing um, programs within the organization to do training for their staff. And we've seen how this has had an impact, at least in the line of, of my work. When we start, well, started working with them in 2019, until today, um, in 2023, yes, we're in 2023, they, their effort has increased in terms of stopping parcels that contains wildlife from the International Hub in Peninsula Malaysia. And that's 10 times. And if this is expanded to other organizations and other agencies, by the very simple step of engaging with them, I think there could be absolutely huge impacts to the work that we're doing. That's fascinating. Uh, Long, I'd like to bring you in here about your, because I, I, I know that your capacity building efforts with local communities is, uh, is another story to tell. Uh, perhaps you'd like to tell that? Yeah, I'd like to tell the story um, that I see uh, my colleague talking about the capacity building in terms of skill, um, organizing and management, and fundraising. Um, we look at the um, capacity in terms of building um, motivation for people who are interested in conservation and species conservation. Um, so I start the training course in conservation, um, primate conservation, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and we recruit students, young students, motivated students, 
uh, who want to do uh, conservation and species conservation. Um, and we bring them to the field and stay in the forest for nine, 10 days with our phone, explore the forest, um, wildlife, and working with the local community, learn about the knowledge, minority, minority knowledge in terms of sustainable yield of forest. And that is really huge motivation to the student. Um, in the last 10 years, we have like 350 students um, join us uh, around the country. Um, and 10% of that is stay with the species conservation, including the people from the first training course set up Green Viet, uh, the organization today. Um, so one thing I want to say that it, we're giving the motivation for the next generation, for the young people, is uh, very important to show them the fact, what has happened uh, in the field and what happened with the species. And they have a chance to engage with the work after that. Uh, it's so important because a um, number of students may want to pursue the career to be a conservationist, but they have uh, to keep their motivation. And that is, uh, this is our, that is our job. Um, and one, another, one thing I learned that that work has to keep motivation, it takes a long time at force. It's not just one course, uh, short term, but it's long term. Uh, the lesson I learned that after 10 years, the, the student stay in the conservation because of long term support. Yeah, yeah this brings me, I, I'd like to throw in a question here from, from which came from the floor, right? This is from uh, Sarah Bonser Blake from Wild Welfare. She asked a question, and I think this is relevant to what we're talking about here. How do we achieve a balanced focus in addressing species concerns? Now, in the, we're talking about training here and capacity building, right? I think a lot of the work that, that organizations are doing tends to steer towards the iconic species. Yeah? And even within critically endangered species, they are the ones that are very sexy, you know, tigers and all that. But then there are others like fish, for example, which get fallen by the wayside, and, and they are equally important. Uh, is this something that capacity building uh, needs to, to start directing towards in order to enable a, a proper uh, addressing of, of all concerns of all critically endangered species? Any of the panelists would like to take that on? Yes? I, I can go first. Um, I, there are a few ways to do it, and I think one obvious one for many of us here is whether you, you can work or support a project that has an iconic species as an umbrella, right? So protecting this rainforest in, in Sumatra, but with, say, I don't know, a, a, a large animal like a tiger or something as an umbrella species, and, and then getting the habitat protected, right? So that all the other animals that exist within that landscape, the fish, the insects, the birds, the snakes, are also protected. Um, at the same time. So, so that's what we call the umbrella or the ambassador species approach is when you have one iconic one that sort of helps bridge the connection between iconic and charismatic and the non-iconic and non-charismatic. Uh, but I think in, in the recent years and together with partners in Southeast Asia, we have been pushing initiatives that look at non-iconic non species. Uh, one, one, believe it or not, are birds. So this whole songbird um, initiative came from the fact that birds were often overlooked in the trade because of things like tigers, rhinos, and elephants. Um, and more recently, pushing for the preservation of uh, what we call Southeast Asian freshwater fish, that where the trade is massive, but there's no protection whatsoever to this particular group te taxa. Um, so working and starting initiatives with N NGOs and organizations that actually focus on, on what we call species that fall through the cracks, um, like yeah. fish. So but and from, no capacity to do that. Yeah, from capacity building, um, the only example I can give you that's relevant to, to in, in this context is, so for example, at, at Mandai, within our veterinary healthcare team, they are pushing the forefront of fish medicine, even invertebrate medicine, which I never know, knew existed until recently. But how do we actually treat insects and, and, and fish, right? So that the skill set is there when you need to step in and right. intervene. Do you want to jump in? If there's time. Yeah, go, go right well, ahead. Well, just to say, I mean, this, this issue of neglected species is actually one of the reasons why that was established. Because 
There's a vast majority of critically endangered species in Southeast Asia, uh, which are, you know, they're not your tigers and, and pangolins and helmeted hornbills. A lot of them are fish, a lot of them, there's a, there's a newt, there's a, there's a reptile that nobody cares about. And a lot of it is about finding the right champions. And that's why a coalition, a partnership approach is quite important. And building the capacity of these organizations in the long term is absolutely crucial. Excellent. Can I take this opportunity to jump now to, to something that uh, I think is of great interest to this audience and also a bit of a controversial topic. And this is the debate between in situ versus ex situ. And uh, I'd like to uh, present this, this uh, put this topic in front of the panel. It, uh, perhaps uh, Long would be the best person to answer this, especially in relation to the Duke. You know, uh, the placing and care of animals in captivity is inherently difficult uh, for people to stomach. Uh, but it's, when you talk about critically endangered species, sometimes there is no other choice. Uh, scientists have a different perspective to, to this when dealing with critically endangered species. And captive breeding sometimes just becomes last resort. Uh, I'd like to have a short discussion on this uh, within the time we have. So, uh, Long, my question to you is, in the case of the Duke Langer, where do you see their journey going within the next 10 years? Well, I think, first of all, I think that today with the species conservation of Duke, the institute and institute conservation have to work, have to work to each other. Because I've been working with the in primate rescue center in Kukfung National Park. We learned that the Great Shang Duke has been hunt and trade and then kept uh, legally in captivity. And we rescued them. But our knowledge about food uh, taking of the Duke uh, is limited. So, and, and they eat leaf, and the leaf it is so abundant in the wild, but it's so limited in captivity, uh, in terms of species. Um, therefore, we have to learn which kind of leaf that is it bring enrich of the bacteria system in the food intake of the Duke, of Great Shang Duke. So the people in the, in the field can do a research on ecology, um, behavior, and food taking, um, and that information is really good to support a successful breeding program of the Great Shang Duke. So you're saying that you have both, in situ and ex situ? At the moment, we collaborate, we still collaborate with the uh, primate Rescue Center in Kukfu National Park. In but we do yeah. the work in the field to collect the behavior data. Right. Yeah. Right. Carita? Yeah. I guess to, to add, you know, the perspective uh, from a trade perspective, um, you know, every time we talk about wildlife crime and illegal trade, there's this push for enforcement. Now, when law enforcement agencies do enforcement, that means confiscation of animals. Um, very often that means hundreds and hundreds of animals. I know one, one of our partners here, Flight for example, they work very closely with uh, enforcement agencies in Sumatra. And each one of these confiscations of birds is 2,000 birds. Where do you hold them? Where do you house them? Who has the resources to care for thousands and thousands of birds? So the, the existence of these facilities become extremely important because they do have a role to play in terms of addressing this issue um, more effectively. And it, it, there is a space for these organizations and for XC2 facilities, for example, to be part of the solution for a problem that's not going to go away anytime soon. So the, the last angle I'll add, um, which hasn't been spoken about much, is especially when it comes to critically endangered species that are really, really you know, reduce the small populations in a while is the fact that they suffer from genetic bottlenecks, right? So the minute they start inbreeding, you get a highly inbred population in the wild that will eventually self-implode, they'll, they'll kill themselves through this inbreeding because they get all kinds of um, problems, right, with, with, with their health. So why, why conservation breeding is important is because with conservation breeding programs, you can try your best to enhance genetic viability. Um, therefore, making these animals the, the healthiest they can be genetically to survive in the wild once you release them back. Because you are dealing with populations that are reduced to 
you know, tens of individuals, right, 30, 50, or 100, which left on their own, they're not able to manage the genetics, but if you can intervene as people and try to enhance it, you would have a healthier population that can hopefully survive uh, longer term. I have a question here from Alison White from Arcus Foundation. The question is, these centers, yeah, how can they be integrated into mainstream environmental conservation efforts or programs? Uh, and I think I, I know where this is coming from. You know, this, they are the rescue centers, they are the rehabilitation centers, and they are also the species action plans and all of that. Often, they don't talk to each other. Uh, pardon me if that's a controversial statement, but uh, the question actually goes to that. Should they and can they and how can they be integrated? I can, start, I can start that off. As I said earlier, um, I think the biggest push is to, is to get the one plan approach um, established, which is where XC2 and NC2 partners and stakeholders all come into the same platform and discuss conservation for a species. Um, and two examples that I mentioned earlier, uh, the two specialist groups that were formed and to address the threat of the trade, right? Spe specific to the trade and habitat loss as a secondary of, uh, impact. But um, within that partnership or coalition, if you like to call it that, uh, we have XC2 people um, and members within that. So rescue centers, um, zoological institutions from the region globally are all members of the specialist group because we, we recognize having to bring that half into the NC2 circle and attached to that half is reintroductions or what we call conservation translocations. It's one thing to breed animals under human care but then there's another thing to get them out. So whether it's a rescue animal that's slated for release in a while after it's been rehabbed, or an uh, animal that's been conservation bred for release or translocation back into a while. So having them as members and stakeholders in your coalition or working group is a very big, is, is a very important part of the conservation picture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, maybe just to, to add a little bit more, using the example that Jess mentioned earlier about the uh, songbird trade crisis here in Southeast Asia. Uh, which saw the establishment of the Songbird Trade um, Specialist Group. And within that group, there are a, a number of key sort of thematic areas which is meant to all work with one another. It includes um, site-based protection. It includes uh, law enforcement. Um, it also includes working with captive facilities in terms of understanding, you know, trade is not going to go away. There's a big segment of society that will continue want to either trap or keep birds. How do you deal with uh, this continued demand um, and captive breeding is, is taking place for some species, for example. At the same time, it's about working with, with local communities. And it's also what I mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, when there is a big problem um, of confiscations, for example, XC2 facilities become really important. One example yes. from Vietnam that we integrate uh, in situ and, and in situ conservation is, is we work together to build an action plan for critical endangered species. For example, we have action plan for elephant, we have action plan for uh, the uh, duck language, uh, the katba language. Um, so when people work together to build an action plan to save the critical endangered species that have a chance to listen to each other and to hear the solution for the species, right? So that's, that's something that I've been involved and I think that is a good way to connect and to create people to work with the species. Yeah, this is leading very naturally into trade. Uh, but before we go there, uh, I have another question here, and this is from Praveen, from Humane Society International. Uh, this is the India chapter. His very relevant, pertinent question now in these days of climate change and what's recently happened in Australia with the fires and all of that. These exit facilities, uh, you know, you know centers, we won't call them captive breeding, but just uh, animal shelters and, and facilities that contain animals, they are vulnerable to natural disasters. And often, if you have a rehabilitation program, you tend to put it next to a forest, as opposed to the center of a city. And these, this, this location exposes it or makes it vulnerable 
to fires, to droughts, to you know, all kinds of natural disasters, typhoons. And we've seen right across Asia and probably in other parts of the world uh, exactly this, you know, huge loss of animals and, and uh, huge costs that are involved uh, as a result of natural disasters and climate change. Uh, perhaps you'd like to answer this before we move on to trade? Okay, I'll take a stab at that. Um, oh, sorry, the question actually was, how do we build resilience into wildlife centers against natural disasters from Praveen? So I think another natural disaster to include there is a disease, right, that comes as a, as a natural disaster. Yeah. Um, I, I think the most extreme example is to move facilities. So we've had instances where uh, uh, conservation breeding or rescue centers actually had to totally uproot, get, get financial support to re-establish themselves uh, elsewhere where the threat is lower. Um, there's always this whole idea of reinforcing a facility against natural disasters like typhoon fires. There are ways to do it, but obviously they're not 100% effective. I think that the most, the easiest way to do it is to create what we call disaster relief teams that can, that are trained to respond to a disaster, be it a disease or a, you know, a typhoon or an earthquake or a fire and also to be connected, and going back to coalitions, but to be connected to a network of uh, people that can also provide uh, support from the outside you know, immediately. Um, so connecting to a vet elsewhere, and also what, what ASAP does, for example, right, is how you connect a, a rescue center with vets from Europe right, to help address some of these, um, these issues. So it's tapping into a network, but at least for us at Mandai, at Mandai Nature, what we do have is what we call an emergency response fund. So a special, special bucket of funding that actually goes directly to support um, um, yeah, issues like this. Along, do you have any experience from your facilities? Have you had any acts of God <laughs> attack your facilities? Actually, I uh, have recall my memories of the uh, um, transportation of the critical uh, drug um, from the trade to um, the sand rescue center. So I think that to have a we think for forwards and uh, have a protocols uh, for disease transfers is something to me is very important to protect the species. Uh, I have no experience with the hardware uh, like building rescue center. So, thank you. Uh, can I move on to trade? <laughs> All right. So uh, we we're, we're going to conclude our discussion with with this last topic on trade. Uh, this is an issue that has grown significantly over the past decade as countries and conservation organizations step up their efforts to regulate, control, and simply understand the workings of both legal and illegal trade. Uh, the acceptance of trade in our society and economies today is a new frontier. Uh, and uh, we'd like to just briefly discuss and touch on this issue. So, Kanita, as traffic, obviously the question starts with you. Has trade replaced habitat loss as the biggest cause of critical endangered species over the past 10 years? Or in other words, is there any hope? <laughs> okay, first of all, there is hope, otherwise I wouldn't be here. I think nobody else would be here if there's no hope. Um, has habitat loss replaced, uh, sorry, was the question, has trade replaced has trade habitat loss? Has trade replaced habitat loss? I don't think so. Um, I think habitat loss is going to be a problem for a long time, um, especially as Asia, Southeast Asia keeps developing. Um, ASAP species, I said earlier, I think uh, 285 species, over 30% of, of those species in Southeast Asia land and um, freshwater vertebrate species are fish. 30% of critically endangered land and vertebrate species in Southeast Asia is fish. Do people care about fish, right? And a big contribution to that is habitat loss, infrastructure development, mining dam, for example. Trade, however, continues to be a big problem. Uh, and for a lot of species, trade is a current and immediate problem because the decline is rapid, the decline is immediate. Once you lose them, it is much harder I can't say you can't, I mean, if you lost them, you've lost them, right? And for many species, trade is the most urgent and immediate threat. Um, you get critically injured species being 
packaged in the post and trafficked via post. Um, hel Jess mentioned helmeted hornbills. The, the casks are being sold in markets and the, the markets are right here in Southeast Asia. So for many of these species, trade is the absolute and most immediate threat. A uh, whole pile of different problems that contributes to, to that. One of the biggest drivers, obviously, is because the demand is constant. The demand is, is there, um, and it is a huge demand, um, and a lot of that demand is right here in, in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Uh, Long, I'd like to bring you in this in relation to a question from Greg Tully from Save the Dogs. His question is, which is better, a top-down or a bottom-up approach to manage wildlife trade? Well, I can um, have to answer that from uh, the Vietnamese citizen in a country uh, like Vietnam. The, the top-down, it worked very well when the government recognized how much important. Take a sample of the, the COVID. When the COVID happened, we wrote a letter to the parliament, like all of NGO working on wildlife conservation wrote a letter. And immediately, like in within two weeks, three weeks, the government banned the, the, the market and asked all the divisions and the department, the military, to strictly control the wildlife uh, trade. So in Vietnam, that's happened, right? But I think that for long term or protect uh, wildlife and critically endangered, the work of NGO and CBO and community is, is a grassroots because that related to behavior change. Uh, for Vietnamese, and I believe that some country around like China, Taiwan, the belief on using uh, traditional medicines um, is, is still there. So, and it takes time to uh, persuade and convince people that rhino horn is not work for the cancer, for example. We work on that uh, behavior change, and then also the pangolins and, and elephants that, like that. Uh, it, it's necessary to keep the grass work, grassroots work. That, that what I just... Thank you. Uh, Jess, I'd like to bring you in on, on the last question here, which comes from the floor, and this is from Varnika and Sarita uh, from the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations, or FIAPO. Their question is, can partnerships with government strengthen the enforcement of laws to stem wildlife trade? In, in inverted commas, how do we build political will? That's a really good question. And I think governments are probably the hardest group of people to work with because the appetites between NGO and the government are all very different, our agendas. Um, I, I think it's possible. And I'm going to go to a, a songbird example to, to show that. Back in 2015, when we um, developed our regional strategy for songbirds uh, that were traded, um, one of the things to identify as a working, as a, a specialist group was to uplist the straw bobo which is a songbird found in Southeast Asia that's pretty much gone from most of its range and is only limited to Singapore and some pockets of Malaysia um, and Brunei and Indonesia. Um, but uh, so in 2015, we want to uplist that bird from what we call CITES 2 to CITES 1. For all of you who don't know what CITES is, CITES is a government convention, so intergovernment convention that looks at the trade of wild flora and fauna, essentially. So it's a government reg international government regulatory system. Um, a CITES 2 listing, which is what the straw of the bubble was on, means commercial trade was still allowed. So it's regulated commercial international trade. A CITES 1 listing means no commercial international trade at all. So it's protected from the trade entirely. And back in 2015, we identified that as the, one of the priorities for the straw of the bubble. Governments were in the meeting. So part, part of what we do also as specialist groups and working groups, we do include governments within our network because they, we recognize them as important stakeholders in policy and decision making. So they were there in the meeting and they heard, the same, say, heard us saying that's a key action. But it took us seven years, seven years working with governments, nagging at them every, you know, I don't know, every week or every month to say, you know, what are we going to do about this, this bird? And last year at the CITES COP that took place in Panama, and you know, for the first time the bird was brought up 
in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that meeting. And we successfully, as of actually next month, the Strata bull will be officially a Cytus one bird, meaning no trade at all of that species. But to keep in mind, it took us seven years of engaging governments. So government engagement doesn't, you know, convincing them doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you, you need to be in it as conservationists generally for the long haul. Um, but yes. Seven years. Eh? Seven years. Can you tell? Do you want me to give? Do you want me to say how many years? Or are you waiting? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm going to yeah. draw... An, an I'm, I'm go okay, we, we are almost we're coming to the end, uh, so I'll just leave you the final word with uh, trade. Um, well, just to, to draw on uh, Jess's example for songbirds, uh, now, who knows what the oriental magpie robin is? It is a... Two ants. Oh, man, okay. So, this is as common as a native bird as you can get. Uh, it wakes us up at four or five in the morning and it is really, really common, right? It is not critically endangered, it is not really threatened. In most places, it's not even regulated. But we found out that this common bird was being trafficked in high numbers. Uh, just in 2020, over 17,000 birds were confiscated in just three countries in Southeast Asia. Now, the point of this is that if species are not properly regulated, they're not properly monitored, and they're highly traded, in time, they can become more and more threatened. And the last thing we want is for more species to get on the critically endangered list. We don't want more species to be critically, critically endangered. We want them to move the other way so that they're less threatened and they thrive in the wild. Um, and so, for, for trade threats, unfortunately, they are a huge threat for many species in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Uh, right, we are almost on hop on, hop, hop off time. Uh, and since that is a key milestone in our evening, uh, we're going to bring this to a close. Uh, but before we do that, I would just like to invite each of the panelists to give us one personal statement. Uh, Jess, I'll, begin. I'll start. Um, something that's been articulated many times already, I think it's recognizing that no one organization or person can save a species and that coalitions, partnerships are so important and because you need to rely on a network right, to achieve and work with people to achieve conservation. And I think the last couple, few words I'm going to say is to be part of that solution rather than to be a part of the problem. Um, yep. Thank you. Long? Yep. Um, to me, I think that partnership uh, is very important and partnership in terms of building capacity for local and national um, NGO and the community who are working on conservation of critical endangered is a key for the uh, next 10 years of conservation. Okay. Um, well, I, I think... There is a lot of knowledge. There's a huge wealth of knowledge, of data, of skills, of expertise, and money out there that can be used to solve the problems that we're dealing with. But it is not being used effectively. It's not coming together effectively. And it's not coming together fast enough and at scale. And we do have to talk to one another. And I think it's very important to have conversations with people who we often perceive as problems, but very often they can actually be the ones holding the solutions to these massively complicated problems. And so talking to one another and working with one another is absolutely crucial. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we presented ourselves here before you for the last 45 minutes, 50 minutes actually, we spent several hours together discussing these issues. And it has been an extremely enlightening and a rewarding experience for me. I would like to personally thank all three of you for the time that you're giving here and giving to all of us here. And I'd like to leave this with one lesson, which probably comes from myself, that safeguarding a critically endangered species doesn't happen overnight. It's a long journey. Building the coalitions and partnerships to achieve that takes a very, very long time. 
it involves resources, it involves commitment, and it involves uh, trust. And all of this in context, I leave you with this. It only takes a year to turn a common species into a critically endangered species. So with that, from all of us, thank you.